I'm looking at it again and I kind of want to make a Bertha. Oh no, <laughs> why am I like this? Well, looks like I have to figure out how to make a Bertha now. <sighs> so it's going to be considerably longer than this, it's going to come down to a bit here. I've reworked my pattern piece. Yeah, better. But that was actually surprisingly simple to do and I'm much happier. It's probably going to be less work. I'm going to nift a bit of trim to go down the centre front, so it would only be a little bit, but maybe if I've got time I might do a bit more. I don't know. We'll see. So the next step before I cut my fancy fabric is to cut my lining fabric. And for this, I'm using a brown cotton Silesia, which is a specialist lining fabric I bought a while ago for a half scale project. So you can probably see I didn't use a lot of it, only that much. So I've got about a metre of this and hopefully that will be enough lining fabric to get the bodice out of. I haven't decided if I'm going to line the skirt, interline it, probably I might use tarlatan. But yeah, we're finally cutting out. But before I do that, um, hmm, hmm, haven't really got space to work. So uh, it's five to one, so I'll probably tidy up, eat lunch, and then start cutting out when I come back. Oh, naturally this also will need a good press. But it's finally happening, we're finally onto the making and I'm really excited. I'm s actually, I'm so glad I made this decision. <laughs> I love it, it's gonna be great. Let's go. So I started by giving the Silesia a good press. I couldn't get all of the creases out, but oh well, it's a lining. And then I had to carefully plot the cutting layout. My pattern pieces have no seam allowance and I like to cut my costumes with at least 2.5 centimeters of seam allowance to make them easy to alter in the future but with limited meterage, I had to get a bit creative. Thankfully, I did have enough of this fabric. With that hurdle overcome, I could start cutting my nice silk. <sighs> Finally. I often get cutting anxiety, but I was so excited to actually get to the silk that I just went for it. Again, I've got my massive seam allowances chalked on. And then it was time to start the tacking marathon. I was flatlining this bodice, that is laying the lining piece on top of each fashion fabric piece, sewing them together and then treating them as one layer of fabric. This is the historically accurate way to do it. It's also done in couture and for costumes, it again makes things easier to alter in the future. I try and get them as smooth as possible on top of each other, making sure I'm matching all of the balance marks and seams. Obviously, things are never going to match up exactly, even if you are much better at cutting out than I am. So I tend to use the sewing lines of the lining as my constant, and if the main fabric is a bit off, it's not the end of the world. You can also see in some places I've deliberately cut the main fabric to be bigger so I've got room to fudge things if I need to. And then I use long diagonal basing stitches through the centre of the two layers to start attaching them together. I start in the middle so that I can smooth outwards as I go. I'm using a contrast thread here so that you can see it, but it is often a good idea to use a matching thread so that if any fibres shed or get stuck they're not as noticeable. As I work outwards, I start to drape the pattern pieces over my tailor's ham rather than working with it flat on the table. This is to accommodate the curve of the body. The fashion fabric has fractionally further to go around the body than the lining, so if I were to sew them together completely flat on the table, when I then put it on, I could get some wrinkling in the fashion fabric as it's pulled that bit tighter than the lining. It's a marginal thing, but I like to think it made a difference to getting a smooth finish on the bodice. I also tacked in all the balance marks, also known as notches or registration marks. I do this so that I can see them on both sides of the fabric. As I've sewn the lining and mane together, I can no longer see where I chalked in the markings on the fashion fabric. For that same reason, I also tack in all the sewing lines. Although I don't tack exactly along the chalked in line, but along the inside edge of it so that I don't catch the tacking when machining it later. Yes, it's long and tedious and removing them later is a massive pain, but there's no other way to really get things sewn accurately. So I always do it for a big project like this. As annoying as it is, I've never once regretted taking the time to do it. So if I look a little bit baked, it's because I've actually finished off the hand sewing for this in the garden, which makes a nice change, doesn't it? We're finally at that time of year. So I've basted together all my layers and basted on all the sewing lines and the balance marks. I did a lot of it over my ham to try and get the curve of the body in, but like the sleeves, I don't think I've quite managed to get enough of a curve in really. Um, but we'll see, hopefully it'll be better than nothing. I'm probably now going to, as you can see, it's just like pinned in place on the mannequin, but I'm loving the way it looks, lovely and gold and sparkly. So I'm probably going to pin some seams together, 
do a little bit of modular making here. I have been contemplating piping the seams, but I don't think I have enough piping cord for that. I definitely want to pipe the neckline and the bottom edge of the bodice. And so I won't know I have enough piping to do that really until I've sewn it up. So we're not piping the bodice seams. I do want to pipe the shoulder seam, but it's only this long, so that should be fine. I've been thinking about the order of operations for this one because obviously the bertha needs to be sandwiched in the shoulder seam. So I need to make up the front and sort of pleat the bertha before I attach it to the back. It's actually gonna to come together quite quickly, I think. Famous last words, eh? <laughs> Look at the ridiculous amount of pins I used to pin everything together. Was every one of those pins entirely necessary? Actually, now I think about it, a lot of those seams were curved and easing in curved seams well is very tricky. And so actually the answer is probably yes. Although I do wonder why I didn't just tack it together. And here I've included a clip in real time of how long it actually takes me to sew a seam like this. I'm sewing very carefully, just outside the line of tacking stitches. As I slightly offset these earlier, that should mean I'm sewing precisely along the chalked in line that I transferred from the sewing pattern. I also stop to take up my pins very carefully so that I don't distort the fabric or pull it out of line, and I sew slowly. This is not the kind of project where I'm just ramming it through the machine. I spent all that time perfecting the fit, moving seams over just a few millimetres, and I don't want all that work to have been for nothing. And now you see me batch sewing at 10 times speed because just watching that clip back was painfully boring. Oh my God, all those pins. <laughs> That's me checking to see how I did easing that curve in and all the pins obviously paid off because it worked first time. And now for the other half of the back. You might have noticed I sewed one half with the back piece facing up and the other half with the side back piece facing up. This means I have to ease in the curves differently under the machine. The first time I had the shorter edge of the back facing up, so I was having to stretch it lightly, but this time I have the longer edge facing up, so I'm having to smooth it in. I prefer doing it the second way, but I thought it was more important to sew both seams from top to bottom to smooth the fabric in the same direction to avoid the seams shifting in opposite directions. It's the same thing again for the front, starting at the top and working towards the hem, despite it making it trickier to ease in so that I can get everything smoothed in the same direction. Here you can see me checking it from the right side to see if all those balance marks matched up across the seam. That's why tacking them in is so useful because it's really difficult to tell if they line up from the lining side once it's sewn. And then even the side seams are curved, so more easing in. This one was a bit easier being shorter and more gently curved. Now it's time for pressing. As every single seam is curved, I really needed the help of my tailor's ham. It also doesn't help with the massive seam allowances. Yes, they're great for alterations, but all that extra fabric can pull and clipping them kind of eliminates the point of leaving all that seam allowance in there. So I just had to try my best to press everything flat and just had to accept it wasn't going to be as neat as it could be. With the bodice made up as much as I could, I now needed to make the bertha before I could carry on. My pattern piece had this weird dart in it to give it the shape I would need over the bust. I'd only chalked it on on one half for some reason, so I transferred my chalk markings to the other side using a tracing wheel. This leaves a little row of indentations on the other side of the fabric, so I went over them with the chalk to make them easier to see. Then I carefully pinned in the darts. Like everything else on this project, they were slightly curved, so they were tricky to get to match up evenly. Then I machined them in place. You might have noticed I reversed at the end of the dart here, which I don't usually do, but I decided to do it here to prioritise strength over a crisp point. This dart is going to be covered in fabric, and that's going to be really difficult to get to should it come undone and I need to fix it. Now the darts get pressed towards the centre. Don't mind me, I was just having a chat to my mum while I was doing this. <laughs> And then I put this lining layer of the bertha on the stand over the pinned in place bodice so I could start draping the pleats. So it took me a good two hours, more than that, about two hours and ten minutes, to arrange the pleats for the bertha on the stand. And so I've taken it off now, they're tacked in place, but it looked like this before. I was really nervous because in this photograph the light I think I used the different side of the fabric or a different grain of the fabric or whatever. Um, so they, they are a slightly different 
sort of shade. But I tried flipping it over and thinking, is it worth redoing it? But I think it's just because I've got like opposite biases I've used, if that makes sense. But I think it's just because it's the nature of it being shot, it's gonna look different. Um, I've smoothed it down and it looks a bit better. I don't know, it's one of those things I was like, oh no. I'm not going to fix it. It's just going to be a character of this dress, if you like. Oh well. So I've been wondering about how to finish the edges of this. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to trim it down and turn everything, you know, both edges in and whip over the edges. I think that's probably what I'm going to do. It's probably going to be easiest. And at the centre front, I'll probably press one edge under to meet at the centre front and hand sew it down. You didn't see what I did there, did you? So just fold it under, fold, trim back some more of this excess, fold it under and then hand sew it on top so I can really control where the pleats line up and then there is going to be a bit of knitted applied trim there. Yeah, so I'm really tired now, my back hurts and I didn't, this took so much longer than I expected and now I'm a little bit worried about running out of time on this. After this I have to do the piping, naturally I have to join the shoulder seams, I have to make the skirt, I have to finish my edges inside but that's not the end of the world, I can have unfinished edges if necessary. I originally, you can maybe see, it's going to be out of focus, I'm sorry, you'll just have to cope with that. You can see here I haven't clipped the seam at the waistline and it's puckering and I was hoping I could get away with not clipping it so it could be easier to alter in the future, but I think I'm just gonna have to clip it, unfortunately, because it's wrinkly and ugly and it's gonna pull otherwise. I need to do boning and fastenings and of course make the skirt. So I've still got quite a lot to do. I better crack on. Getting these pleats sewn in place meant even more fussing with them. Honestly, this was such a lot of work. I really began to regret this decision in the end. I'm not sure if this was the best way to construct a Bertha. If I'd had more time, I would have done some more research to try and find a better method, particularly for finishing these edges because it was so time consuming. I thankfully realized that I only needed to finish the bottom edge of the Bertha as the top edge could be finished with the neckline piping. But sewing this one, having already tacked the pleats in place was a nightmare. I had to do it from the wrong side to be able to see the tacked in line of the neckline, but I needed to make sure I only caught the first layer of fabric, not the fabric of the first pleat that would lie on that first bit of fabric so it looks like the pleats emerge seamlessly from the neckline. It was fiddly and annoying and I'm sure there would have been a better way to make this work but I didn't have the time to do any more research so I just went for it. It did work but boy it was annoying. Next I had to make the piping. Thankfully, I had lots of scrap fabric left from the Bertha that was already sort of cut on the bias that made this less wasteful and easier to cut. This is the part of the video where people will be screaming at their screens, why don't you just use a rotary cutter? This is your reminder that they are painful and dangerous for me to use because of my disability and that there's no such thing as the right way to do things in sewing. If it works for you and you get a good result, then it's the right way. If it doesn't work for you, then do it in a way that does work for you and that's okay too. We're all individual people with individual needs and I need to have the blades as far away from my fingers as possible. Thank you. And now we're making the piping. See that there where my fingers stopped working and I flicked the presser foot across the sewing machine? That's why I don't want a spinning blade anywhere near them. Anyways, yes, the piping. So I have this narrow piping cord, I think it's three millimeter in my stash from when I made Little Dorrit. And I fold the bias strips over it, encasing the cord, and then using the zipper foot, I stitch close, but not too close to the cord. You might have noticed I haven't folded the fabric of the bias strip over evenly, and that's because you only grade it down later anyway, and this way you can make the bias strips thinner and save fabric. I then pinned the piping all around the neckline on the right side and machined it in place. I'm lining the sewing line of the neckline up with the inside edge of the piping cord so that it's really snug. I deliberately didn't stitch it this snugly earlier so that there won't be any visible stitching now. When I flip the piping around to the inside, all the raw edges will be enclosed and it'll give a really neat finish. I'm having to be very careful to avoid the pleats of the Bertha here too, so I'm really taking my time. I then did the same thing for the back neckline. This was a lot easier as there was no bertha or decoration on the back. I'm piping the entire back edge, including the overlap for the fastenings, and leaving lots of excess at the shoulders. 
This should make it very easy to alter. All I'd have to do is move the hooks and bars, and even if I had to put a piece in at the shoulder, I'd have enough piping there to still have a nice continuous line at the neck. With the necklines finished, I could join the shoulder seams, making sure the edges of the piping lined up. With all that extra bulk from the Bertha, I decided to turn the stitch length up a bit to hopefully make the seam a bit smoother. I had to do a little bit of fiddling around to figure out how I wanted to finish the seam in the piping so it was subtle and smooth, but I was confident my plan would work, so I repeated the process for the bottom edge so I could move on to the hand finishing. Okay, so where are we? I've been finishing the top and bottom necklines, so the top is all herringboned in, and I've pinned the bottom in place, ready to hand sew, which I'm probably gonna do in the garden because it's nice weather. Um, as you can see, I've left I haven't finished the ends at the top yet, but at the bottom as well, I've left loads of extra piping in. And I've done it in sections. So at every, at every seam, there's also a seam in the piping. And that is deliberate to make it much easier to alter should I ever need to alter it. Because the likelihood is I'll get bigger and I'll need to let it out. So I'll need extra piping. I've also piped, that's the centre back, and I've piped all the way to the edge here. So. Um, the easiest way would be to just move the hooks so that then I don't have to do anything, I can just move the hooks. So that's the logic there. I'm going to hand sew this and then my next, in terms of order operations, next would be to put in the sleeves. And there's several things that I'm nervous about in terms of putting in the sleeves. Firstly, the armhole is so tight and I'll need to snip into it and I'm worried about just ripping through. Also, where I've applied my bertha, you can see it goes over the sewing line. So should I put the sleeve in on top of the bertha or should I like try and unpick this a little bit and then reapply the bertha on top? And seeing as it took me so long to get this bertha just right, I'm reluctant to unpick it. And I have looked at some examples and they do have the bertha caught in the sleeve seam. You know, I think it will work, but yeah, I'm nervous about that. And then as well, if I put piping in there that's gonna be a really bulky seam and it's already really tight and we have these two stupid weird angles because that's the nature of this sort of sleeve <sighs> i don't think i have any piping left so maybe we don't pipe them will the piping help with the knot ripping it out will it act as a sort of like stay stitching maybe maybe that's why they did it well first things first i've got a hands i've got herringbone this um piping down so let's do that first Look at this messy, messy desk. So yeah, a herringbone stitch is also known as a catch stitch and I'm using it here because it's a curved edge and uh, it gives you, it gives the fabric movement, it gives it room to move about and shape to curves. So um, I could have turned this edge under and felled it down but as this is a bias cut edge, it won't fray. Also, herringboning over it is sort of got the same effect as an overlocker stitch. It will stop it unraveling. So it's just flatter, quicker, more efficient to do it this way. And I'm not going through to the front of the fabric. I'm just catching the flat lining. I did indeed decide to pipe the armholes. I did some research and yeah, the reason that they used piping was to reinforce that very tight and restrictive sleeve seam. You see, people in the past weren't stupid. There was usually a logic to the things they did. I mean, it wasn't always a correct logic, but sometimes it was. This is me pressing the piping into a curve completely out of frame. But pressing it vaguely into the shape you're going to sew it onto can make it easier to attach. This was still incredibly fiddly, especially around the almost right angle that these armholes have at the point where the underarm section begins, but eventually the sleeves were in. A tan and a roller set. It's like pre-pandemic, Claude. So, the bodice is nearly there. We are down to now just hand sewing tasks mostly. So I need to put the bones in, I need to hem the sleeves, but I want to do that with it on properly with all the gear on so that I know I've definitely got them in the right place because I also need to do some research and look and see just how long they are. Do they reach to the crook of the elbow? Do they need to 
you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I have my hand knitted trim, which I have now finished knitting, uh, which is upstairs, so I can't show it to you, which needs to be hand sewn on the front and the shoulders. And I have to do the centre back fastening and then we're on to the skirt. So I have spiral steel, which I think is what I'm going to use for the boning, which yes, is heavy, but is quite comfortable in terms of flexibility. So I think that's what I'm going to use. I just have to figure out what I'm going to use as boning channels. Do I want to cut strips of fabric or shall I use just like cotton tape or something? So today is not a great day. I had an event yesterday, which um, has tired me out, hence the hair. I'd forgotten how bouncy it is. So it's just sort of thing I'm in the mood for really, a gentle bit of hand sewing. Although I don't know whether I'll be strong enough to cut the bones. I might have to recruit a willing volunteer to help with that. Also known as my dad. <laughs> this is the kind of chaos I work in. <laughs> with the bones cut to length with the help of my glamorous assistant, I started adding the little metal caps. I used needle nose pliers for this, but it was so fiddly and they kept puffing off, so I don't know if I did this right. The process was really annoying, so if you know of a better solution for these, please let me know. To make the boning channels, I just used some twill tape and folded it around the steels using a zipper foot to sew them inside the tape snugly. This isn't the most elegant way to make boning channels, but it was quick. Then I could hand sew the bones in place. I waxed the thread for strength and herringboned them into the flat lining over the seams. I'm going through the layers of the twill tape and the seam allowance and the flat lining so they're really secure in there. The bone casings are a touch too long for the bones so I can scrunch up the tape ever so slightly as I sew it in to keep the fabric under tension and get that sprung feel. This effect is difficult to describe but it is a bit like easing in a seam. The extra length of the bone should pull the shorter seam taut and keep it under tension so it doesn't collapse. So, I didn't get very much done yesterday, like I say it was a bad day. But what I did manage to do was put everything on, apart from the chemise. Hang on. Russell, Russell, Russell. So I managed to herringbone the bones in. Unfortunately, I don't know what's happened. This thumb? It's given up. It just hates hand sewing at the minute. I can't grip anything with it, which is really annoying when you're trying to herringbone in sprung steel boning because you need to really grip it. But I was able to do that and I tried it on and the sleeves, I took the sleeves in from the mock-up and I've taken them in too much. I need to let them out a bit more. And I was hoping I wouldn't have to cut anything away around the armhole, but there's a lot of stuff in there and it's just a bit too tight. So what I might do is trim some of it out the piping I can definitely trim. I don't want to snip into it and notch it because that is makes it more likely to tear. And I have a centimetre and a half seam allowance there anyway, so I don't really want to cut away any more of the actual seam allowance. But mm, I'll see what I can do, basically. I think at this point it, there needs to be less somewhere. Plan for the day, alter the sleeves, I still need to hem the sleeves, but because I couldn't get my arms in quite far enough. I wasn't sure how much I wanted to hem the sleeves. I also want to look at some like fashion plates to see just how long they are. And then I've got to do the back closure and because it, it's quite snug, so I might sort of give myself an extra half a centimetre when I sew the bars in or something like that, or when I put the hooks, hooks in, something like that. So I've got a little bit more room to, a little bit more wiggle room, room to breathe. Again, look at the chaos on this desk. Oh my God. So I'm gonna keep them the same at the armhole because that bit's fine. It's just over the bicep. So I think I took it in two centimeters on each pattern piece. So like maybe huh, a bit more like that. Yeah, down to a centimeter. So that can be my new sewing line. Where's the other one? Unfortunately, this silk turns out marks quite badly, even though I did a test. Obviously, didn't do it, didn't leave the stitching in long enough. So I've got all this basting, which is going to leave marks. And probably when I let this seam out, there'll be a mark too. Grand. And this is why we leave large seam allowances. Tell you what, while we're here. Mm. 
I'm doing it one layer at a time so I don't accidentally cut something I don't want to. I'm going to leave this bit in because if I ever want to adjust that seam, I'll need that bit there. So that will just have to flap about, unfortunately. I can at least trim some of the excess silk there and here. Having reduced as much bulk as I could around the armholes, I let the sleeves out. I stitched in the new seam before unpicking the old one. I did end up with the silk scarring, but as it's mostly in my armpit, I don't mind too much and it was worth it to have the sleeves be more comfortable. With that adjustment made, I added the spiral steel to the centre back seam. I tacked it in by hand first and used my zipper foot to get really close to the edge of the bone so it wouldn't wriggle around in the boning channel. You can see me using my fingernail to really push that bone as far over into the seam as possible so I can sew it in there really tightly. Here you can see just how bad the scarring is on that underarm seam. I hoped that wetting it first would help to get the creasing out if not the stitch marks but it didn't really make that much of a difference. So I'm at the point of sewing on the hooks and I do this in a very similar way to Nikki from Liam. She has an excellent tutorial on, very detailed tutorial on how to do it. It's kind of interesting. I guess if you make opera or ballet costumes globally, there's sort of a standard way of doing things. But what I have realised is I only have this many of this hook. I need to buy some more. And so it means I'm having to space them further apart than I would like. But basically what I did was put one top and bottom and then I had eight left. So I divided uh, the difference between them by eight to find approximately where I wanted how far apart they were. My bottom two are four mil closer together than the rest of them. But that's all right because quite often that's where you want more support. So I've got doubled silk buttonhole twist here, which I have put beeswax on. This brown colour was sort of the best match I had, but I'm not that bothered about it. It's quite subtle. And you can see um, I've sort of moved my centre back over about the bone's width, and that should hopefully just give me a little bit more room to breathe. So I'm going to sew these hooks on. I might be here for a while, and then I'll show you the bars. Where did it go? So all the hooks are now on and I've also sewn on the bottom two bar or the top and bottom bar and you can see I've set them in a bit from that centre back line, line. Oh you can't see that and that's because firstly I want a bit more room but also when you hook it and it's held under tension of course it doesn't sit exactly on that line. So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to hook those back in and then I'm going to fold this like that. And I could use a pin, but because this fabric marks so much, I'm just going to do it with chalk instead. And again, I'm just sewing over it with the um, waxed buttonhole thread. I'm only doing three stitches like that because if I um, am likely to let it out, it's much easier to move the bars than it is the hooks. So I, as much as I want it secure, I don't want it so secure that I'll hate myself if ever I need to alter it. Let's be Avenue. Oh, also, I did the classic thing of um, divided by eight, which of course gave me eight gaps and seven hooks. So I've got one left over. <laughs> I'm going to say this was deliberate and this is my spare one, just in case, you know, I lose one. I could have put interfacing on this section, but I haven't, purely because I forgot. So... Let's just hope for the best. And I'm putting the opening of the hook. This is something that Nikki talks about as well. There's like a little opening where it's been bent round. I'm putting that facing the hook. Uh, because it's a bit stronger that way. 
With the bars on, all I had to do was add the knitted trim to the shoulders and centre front. I'd knitted the trim using a vintage knitting pattern for insertion lace from a knitting pattern book from the 1840s. I used silk embroidery thread as the yarn and I was able to sew the trim on with the same thread so it matched perfectly. So, the bodice is finally done, which means we're now onto the skirt, which hopefully shouldn't be as complicated as the bodice was. No fitting really necessary. I'm going to cut some rectangles and gather them onto a waistband. However, I have a bit of a dilemma because ideally I would flatline the skirt. However, as I discovered from making this, unfortunately, if I put a pin or even a th tacking thread in this fabric, I get a little pin mark left. So unfortunately, all down the centre front and every panel and lots of other places, I have marks from where I put tacking in. When you flatline big panels, really, you need to do lots of big tacking stitches down through the middle of them. And I'm not going to be able to do that. And I have contemplated, can I like buy some of that spray stuff that quilters use? Can I use double sided tape? Things like that. But I think I'm just going to not flatline the skirt. I think it will be okay. I've got lots of big puffy petticoats. I think I'm going to face the hem instead and that should hopefully give it some volume as well. That's the plan. I've got my cutting table out. I've tidied up a bit. So I think let's make a start on the skirt. I've got a dilemma now because I've just unrolled the silk to cut my skirt panels and um, it's got loads of long floors all the way across the width of the yardage. And um, I was like, oh, it's, at first I thought it was just at this end. And I was like, oh, okay, but the more I go, look, there's another one. They look like pools or something. Um, yeah, can you see it? Yeah. There's another one right down this folded section here. So I bought this fabric dead stock and I imagine it was, I think it was also listed as seconds, so it was cheap which was why I was able to afford real silk for this. And it is um, dupion, so it does have slubs in, but that is so noticeable. Do I really want that going across the horizontal width of my dress? And yes, I know it's going to be gathered, but part of me is wondering if it's actually better to have it run vertically and it'll get slightly more lost in the pleats and the gathers and things, in which case, I would just cut however many meters I want for the circumference of my skirt, which I think I looked up in Nora War, I want about three meters, three meters 20, something like that, just 10, and sort of use the silk as a facing. I think that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna cut this way instead and just have one seam at the center back and a very deep hem. <laughs> I'm a fool, because what I hadn't considered is of course this fabric is shot. So if I have the skirt going, in that direction, it's a completely different colour to the bodice. Shit. So, there's not much I can do, so I'll just have to cut this into panels or just completely recut the skirt fabric and just deal with the fact that there's going to be ugly horizontal lines all across it, which is really annoying given how much work and effort and stuff I've put into this project. That's the price you pay for being poor, I guess. That was a joke. <laughs> As the silk was very crumpled from my trying it this way and that, I took it upstairs to the big ironing board and the big iron to give it a proper press. It had been folded on the bolt for well over a year, so there were some pretty deep set creases to go with all those flaws in the fabric. <laughs> Being a silk dupion, once it was cut into panels, it started to shred at the raw edges, so everything got overlocked. I didn't do any seam finishing on the bodice, but as the seams were mostly curved, they didn't fray in the same way as the skirt panels. Wherever possible, I tried to use the salvage of the fabric, and of course, I'm chalking in my sewing lines so that those skirt seams will be nice and straight. Naturally, no ball gown is complete without a set of pockets, so I cut out some of the leftover cotton Silesia lining fabric to make mine. This pattern I drafted myself based on the examples in books like Janet Arnold, and I referenced some YouTube videos on the subject. To make the pocket opening less visible when the skirt is worn, I included a pocket facing. I cut this from a scrap of the silk, and it's just the same shape as the pocket pattern piece, it just ends after a few centimetres. The facing is pinned in place and then overlocked to the fabric of the pocket, as well as all the other raw edges of the pocket pieces. 
You might be wondering why I'm using black thread on my overlocker and not brown, and that's just because I didn't have any brown, I'm cheap and didn't want to buy any, and at this point I was kind of in a hurry to get this done, so details like that weren't high up on my list of priorities. The raw edge of the silk facing piece just got zigzagged in place. There are neater ways to do this, but this method is quick and easy, and it does the job. It's the inside of a pocket on a ball gown I'm probably going to wear once. Like I say, priorities. I couldn't put the pockets in a seam because of the way I had had to cut the panels of the skirt, so I had to cut a slit in the centre of a panel and sew the pieces of the pocket lining to the slit instead. Everything got a good press, and then I stitched a short dart in the bottom of the pocket seam to kind of fake a side seam. Again, Nikki from Liam has a whole series on this technique if you'd like to do this for yourself, which explains it in much more detail than the rushed clips I was taking at this point in the process. And then you can sew the two halves of the pocket together. This bit is very tricky, and you have to be incredibly precise with where you start stitching so that you don't end up sewing too far and the pocket opening doesn't line up. After that, you just have to sew around the curves, which, I mean, isn't the easiest, but if your pocket bag's a bit wonky, it's much less noticeable than if the opening is all puckered. Again, you have to be very precise where you stop sewing, and I made sure to check that I'd done a good job, and yeah, I was pretty pleased with it. You can barely see the pocket is there, which is what we want. With the pockets in place, I could sew up the side seams of all the panels into a tube. Of course, I left an opening at the centre back so that I could get the skirt on. I'm following my chalked on sewing lines so that everything stays lovely and straight. Then the skirt seams get a press, naturally, and I fussed about with the pocket opening some more to press those in place and make them even more invisible. Here I'm cutting strips of fusible interfacing for the top of the skirt where I'm going to cartridge pleat it. You can get interfacing on a roll for this purpose, but I just used what I had. I used the iron to fuse the interfacing to the top edge of my skirt, and this will create the folded over edge through which I sew my cartridge pleats. The cartridge pleats were only going to be on the back of the skirt. For the front, I was doing a box pleat in the centre and then knife pleats either side. There's a whole formula to figure out how wide to make your pleats. I did try that method and I'm using that piece of dotted paper there as a template, but honestly, no matter how much maths and measuring I do, and I'm a confident mathematician, I always end up with things being a little bit off anyway, so I try not to worry about it too much. Having studied quite a few historical garments myself, I just do what the Victorians do and make the outside of the pleats look nice and even and just fudge the inside until it fits. <laughs> I have come to prefer using clips for pleats. I knew I was probably going to have to move them, and given the way this fabric marked, I knew I didn't want to be sticking loads of pins in it. I found I could use my grade of ruler as a set square and my fingernail to make a little crease in the fabric so that I could get a really crisp fold as I made my pleats without having chalk everywhere. I did tack the pleats in place, despite knowing it would leave marks behind, because I thought the trade-off was worth it to not have to keep redoing those pleats. I tried to keep the tacking inside the seam allowance so it wouldn't be seen when the skirt was made up, and then I remembered the bodice will cover it anyway, so I worried about it a little less. <laughs> you can see all my maths on the note there, but when it came to do the other half of the skirt front, for whatever reason, it didn't work out the same as the other side. I ended up unpicking and redoing the last two pleats to make it fit, and you know what? No one ever noticed. <laughs> And then this is me ripping off the interfacing I just applied to the waistband because it was too wide and reapplying a narrower piece. If you're familiar with cartridge pleating, you'll know you have to make up and finish the waistband and then hand sew the pleats on. But as I also had knife pleats at the front, I was going to have to sew those pleats to the unfinished waistband, then finish it, then do the back pleats. I pressed the waistband in half and marked the centre front and then where the knife pleats would end and then where the cartridge pleats would end, leaving a generous amount for overlapping. With the waistband ready, I could start prepping the top of the skirt back for pleating. I turned in the edge of the centre back opening and then folded over the top edge along the edge of the interfacing strip. You can see how crisp the interfacing has made that folded edge now. I then chalked in the lines that I will follow to sew the pleats into the folded top edge. I think mine were half a centimetre down from the top edge and a centimetre apart. But of course, before I could start pleating the back, I have to add the waistband to the front. As always, when sewing through lots of layers and pleats, I went incredibly slowly, smoothing and pulling the pleats into position as I go. I could then finish making up the waistband and add the cartridge pleats to the back. 
As this is done by hand, I think I did it in the evening, hence the dressing gown, but of course things never go smoothly on these projects, do they? So there I was the other evening, sewing away all my skirt waistband, beautifully sewing in all my cartridge pleats, which I was very pleased with. And I got one side on and I thought, oh, I'm just going to try it on and check it's going to fit. And it does fit. However, for reasons that escape me, I put the pocket underneath the cartridge pleats. So that means when I wear the skirt, I can't get my hand in the pocket without like going back on myself like that. So I'm going to have to unpick all of these cartridge pleats and the front half of the waistband, put the pockets the way they're supposed to go and re -sew it all again. It's one of those things, it, is, it would be fine, I could just have the pockets facing backwards, but um, I don't want this to just be fine, you know, I want it to be beautiful. I want to feel perfect when I wear it. So, <sighs> where are my little scissors? Upstairs, great. So yes, I started unpicking all those hand-sewn cartridge pleats, the hand finishing I'd done on the inside of the waistband, and the stitching I'd done to sew the pocket to the waistband. Thankfully, the stitching threads for the pleats themselves could stay in place, but it was a lot of work to undo for such a stupid mistake. And of course, it made putting the waistband back together more difficult, and so for the sake of my hands and my sanity, I made the decision to machine sew the waistband this second time around. See my previous point about it not being seen under the bodice. <laughs> you know we're really chasing a deadline when the camera starts wobbling. <laughs> The cartridge pleats obviously got redone off camera. I think I must have done them in bed, but then I could add the hooks. I didn't have any skirt hooks, so I used fur hooks. They work fine for me. You just have to make sure you tack them down at the end so they don't flap about. I also added a popper to keep the underlap from flapping about. It adds a little extra support to the skirt, but the hook is doing most of the heavy lifting. Now the hem of the skirt. You might remember I said I wanted to face it. Well, because of the way I had to recut the panels after I realised my mistake about the directional colour thing, I had one panel that was considerably shorter than the others. It was barely long enough to turn up at all, so I had to really jerry-rig this bit. To make the facing, I just used strips of calico. I just tore them into lengths and then you could enjoy some sexy, sexy shots of my elbow as I press them flat and turn under one edge. Four. I then had to do this weird thing where I pinned the facing to the shortest section of the skirt first, then had to try and keep it level around all the other sections where I had considerably more seam allowance. You can see I'm machining the facing on with barely a foot's width of seam allowance here, but there's loads on the next panel. But once the facing was on, I could press it around to the inside, covering all those weird seam allowances. Then it just needed hand sewing in place, and the dress was ready for the ball. Do you know, I'm really pleased with how this dress turned out. I'm often very critical of my own work, but there's very little I'd want to change about this dress. I'm so glad I went for the Bertha with the knitted trim and the colour and the shimmer of the silk in the evening light was just gorgeous. I was very relieved to finally have this project done and it was ready in plenty of time to wear to the ball in Bath. But then a probably not very sensible idea struck me. With a week to go before the ball, I added something else to my to-do list. Thanks for watching. See you next time.